Alright, he has a look. Well, I have, but... Should I close it and try to fix this up? Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're here just trying to work out some uh, tech on the camera. This week it's beginner beekeeping Q&A. So what we're going to be doing is covering some tips on the hive tool and how to use it. But first, it's springtime here, so we're harvesting a little honey and that'll just be harvesting away while we're busy working the apiary. So I'm just going to put my key in here like this and turn it to a 90. And what that's done is it's made channels inside the comb honey will flow down and out and into the jar. My father and I worked on that invention for a decade and it's wonderful to be able to share it with people all over the world now. You can see the honey coming out, which is a beautiful thing, that lovely golden honey colour of spring. And the amazing thing, honey is full of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, enzymes, medicinal properties. It's just an extraordinary thing and just to be able to sit here and watch it pour out of the hive is such a joy. There's the, the first drops just coming down right now. So while that's happening, we're gonna go and do a brood inspection and show you a little bit how to use the J Hive tool. So this is the J Hive tool here, and it has multiple uses. And what we're going to do is get right in there, do our brood inspection, and if we're lucky, we might even see a virgin queen today. So without further ado, let's do that. But because we're wandering away from this hive, I'm just going to cover up so that no rubber bees can come, just like this. This is just a little bit of a, a, a wax kitchen wrap, but you can also use any kind of wrap or even your hat and your veil if you, if you don't have it. So we'll leave that there while we're over here on this hive doing our brood inspection. So this is the little hive that was split two weeks ago from the hive we're harvesting from right now. And Bija here, she did that split with Pete and last week we did an inspection and what we found was a queen cell. So if we're lucky, we'll see a virgin queen in here today. If you wanna blow a little bit of smoke in the front of that, just by putting the nozzle of a smoker right right against the entrance, right against it. Don't be shy, there, that way it goes in. A couple of puffs is all you need for a little colony like this, and done. Now a good idea to leave your smoker somewhere near the front so they keep getting a whiff. Now, it's been raining a lot here, there's no fire danger, but it is something to think about. But well done. Next, the roof comes off. And you're already well suited up, but I'm not. So I might put my veil on. If you're new to beekeeping, do protect yourself with a good bee suit. Wear your gloves. Um, not like Pete here, if you saw the split a couple of weeks back, didn't wear anything at all. Only do that if you're a very experienced beekeeper and you don't mind a few stings. Okay, just doing that up. Make sure you do up both sides. There we go, Beej is away. She is a beginner beekeeper, but she's quickly getting the hang of what to do. Okay. Sorry about all the crunchy noises, there we go. So what she's doing, which is a great thing, is having a look for a queen on here. Sometimes she can be right up on the lid and you don't want to orphan her from the hive. So we're having a look for a bee that's got a bit of a different stride, which is a little bit longer and often less stripy. And as she gets older, she'll have a really shiny back plate. But we know that she's going to be a virgin queen here because this hive two weeks ago had no queen at all. And this hive is making a, a made a queen that we saw inside a queen cell last week. So put that right leaning against the entrance just in case we've missed her, she can walk back into the hive. Now, if you have a look here, you can see our bees are centered centrally and the frames have been pressed together, which is a really good tip when you are doing a split or starting a, a colony from a swarm 
is to press your frames together. That keeps the bee space for the bees to naturally draw their comb. Now, we're going to put our little shelf brackets on and that will aid a, as a frame rest. So the way you put these on is you over the screw and down. If you've adjusted them right, they'll be nice and tight like that. And we did that last week. The other ones here, like this, and there's your nice little frame rest. Okay, so next, you want to show me how you use the hive tool. Yeah, now, not very well. This is what I need. <laughs> some help so, okay, so we first, which one are we going to do? Well, let's just start with an edge one because that'll be the easiest one to get out first. Sometimes the middle one's easier, but you just have a look and see how gunked up things are in the hive with their propolis and wax. This end's a chisel end, and this end's the J end. And they're the basic two functions, is you're using the chisel and you're using the J. So the first thing you're going to do is use the chisel end just to break the propolis that the bees have put between these two frames. That's it. Beautiful. And same on the other end. So going sideways first is a really good idea. That's it, perfect. Now, before you go too far, that's actually a tip. We'll just put it back a little bit closer. The J hook goes under the end bar, that's it. Now that's not to be confused with putting it in here because you don't want to dig into the comb. So that's the perfect spot. And then you're levering against the neighboring frame up like that. Beautiful. Well done. And you can then lift that up if it's free, or you might need to free up the other end as well. So lifting that up, what have we got? A brand new wooden frame with a comb guide in the top and not much action on it at all yet. So let's just put that one aside. I'll shake these bees back in just in case we miss the queen. They're unlikely on the edge like that. Next one, let's have a look what's going on on the next frame. Again, chisel end in between the end bars. So the end bars are these here. You can add a little smoke if you need to clear the bees out of the way. And then you'll be swapping to the J end again. That's it. I can hold that for you. Okay, so that's it, beautiful. Beautiful example of which way the J goes. You're hooking under the frame you want to lift, that's it. So now swap hands, that's it. There's a little trick there. And swap your hive tool to the other end if you need it. You don't really need it on this one because it's already so loose. Yeah, this is the bit where I get, gets tricky. And now under that one with the J if you needed to. Yeah. And then up. So nice and gentle. Wow, that's going to be a very delicate frame because last week there was nothing in this frame and now what you can see is they've been doing an amazing job building the naturally drawn comb on the comb guide. So all we've given them is a wooden frame and they're filling it in with their wax. Now if I, uh, if I just brush these bees out of the way a little bit, you'll start to see their virgin wax, which is when it's bright white like that, that's their wax they're excreting from their wax glands and using their mandibles they're manipulating it into these beautiful hexagon shapes and one bee might only contribute to a tiny bit of a cell but somehow they follow a pattern which happens to be an amazing piece of engineering the hexagon lattice is the strongest way you can support the honey because honey can be quite heavy there might be three kilograms in here with using the least uh, sidewall area so it's a wonderful piece of engineering the bees do. And look at that, they're doing a great job. If they were starting to go wonky on the comb, we would just push them back in line. And that's a little bit of maintenance you need to do on a naturally drawn comb. But they will keep extending that pattern and eventually they'll connect it to the sides and then it will be quite robust. But for now, you don't want to tip over that comb or it'll actually snap off because it's already got a bit of weight to it, but it's not very well supported yet. Isn't that wonderful? So what we can do is just move this frame right over here. I'll put these on the other side just because it's a bit easier for you to see on the camera. 
hand down and rather than going in the dips of those we're going to go closer to the hive so we're on the up point so bring it back towards you a little bit yeah the bees are used to tight spaces that's it perfect and that way we can fit three on these comb guides if we need to beautiful well done so let's just go over that again first of all we're adding a little bit of smoke this one will be a bit more sticky because it's an older frame and then we're using the chisel end between the end bars to give us a little bit of sideways movement so a little bit of smoke again chisel between the end bars and away we go Today it's beginner beekeeping Q&A, no such thing as a silly question. If you've got questions, put them in the comments below. Some places out there in the world, it can be a bit of a challenge learning beekeeping, but here we like to be really supportive and we dedicate one of these live sessions every month just to beginner beekeeping questions so that you have a comfortable spot to just ask questions no matter how silly they are. We all started off as new beekeepers once, we all had silly questions, it's quite okay to ask them. And the whole idea is we inspire um, you to get started in this amazing world of bees or perhaps you've already started and you just need to learn more. So go for it, put your questions in below. Here we go. We've got a comb that's been used for a while now and you can tell the difference because it's darker in here. So these bees are being friendly so I'm putting my ungloved hand right in close but if they were looking a bit agitated I wouldn't do this. And wear gloves if you're new to beekeeping. I'm seeing a lot of pollen in there and a little bit of honey. Now what's going to be interesting in this hive is we're unlikely to see much brood because we took a split two weeks ago so all of the capped brood should have emerged and now we will have sometime soon a mated queen starting to lay eggs so we're going to keep a lookout for that and we're also going to keep a lookout for the virgin queen she's harder to spot when she's a virgin because she's a bit smaller any questions coming through Yes, yeah, so you know, amazing today. We've got people from Canada and Ireland and of course all our Australian uh, beekeepers. It's fantastic. Um, so this is a question from Tully in uh, the Sutherland Shire in Sydney in Australia here. Just wondering, is adding a second brood box an alternative to doing a split? And if so, is now the time to do it? The answer is yes. Well done. Now, if you don't want to take a split, which is my preferred way of getting started, uh, sorry, reducing the congestion inside a hive and helping uh, either yourself start another hive or helping somebody else start a hive, it, is you take a split. And I like to do that because it keeps the colonies a bit more manageable. You don't have to look through multiple boxes to look for the queen and so on. But you can, of course, make more room in the box, which will help. So. To do that, you could, as you say, add an extra brood box or an extra honey super, and both will free up room and allow the colony to expand and lessen the congestion, which is the primary swarming trigger. So in the springtime, you could add more boxes to your hive. Lots of beekeepers do that. Or you could take splits, and both will, will limit the swarming tendencies and will be uh, a good thing for either increasing the size of that hive or creating another one. Fantastic. See, the cat's asking, does wormwood help with pest control when placed under the lid? Ah, I have no experience with that, but if you do, chime in to the thread and let us know whether you've had any experiences with wormwood. Okay, this one looks like it's got a lot of honey in it. Let me know if it feels heavier because I can see the honey at the top and the bees, uh, they don't have any brood to, to raise. So they will be storing honey with this spring nectar flow. It's not too much heavier. Not too much heavier, okay. The honey's only around the edge. And look at the size difference in cells that the bees have done. You can see here we've got quite large cells. So 
they'll do them when they want to raise drones, which you can see a drone cell there, they stick out like a more bullet shape. So interestingly enough, the drones have a longer cycle. So they are a 24 um, day um, cycle, whereas the, the workers are 21. So we're still seeing some brood here and it's been two weeks since we took the split. So 14 days, the cycle is 21 days for a worker. So we are still seeing some brood. So they must have been eggs when you took the split and now they're in their capped uh, phase where they're going through their metamorphosis and they'll emerge into the hive as a young fluffy baby bee ready to do all of the chores of the hive soon. Back to the cells, you've got large ones here. Now just compare that to the ones down here for a second. Much smaller. So they're the worker size cells there that they'll use for raising uh, the brood of the workers about 5.3 millimetres and here we have drone size cells which are 6 millimetres. They also like to use those larger cells for honey storage because they store more honey, a little more efficient. Any questions coming through? Yes, Cedar, um, there's a question coming in from a real beginner just saying, you know, what are your tips and what should they, someone who really wants to start and loves bees, what would be your sort of first sort of maybe tips to, for them getting started? Okay. There's a few different ways people like to learn. I'm the type of learner that just likes to jump in and learn as you go, so that's what I would recommend. Just get get some, get a hive, or get order a hive to put together, and then order your bees, or take a split from a friend, and I would really recommend doing some online learning. We've got a great course at thebeekeeper.org, which is also a fundraiser, and there's a big, uh, learning curve there from square one right through to even a deep scientific knowledge. So I would recommend learning as you go, just get into it and start, don't wait another 10 years and, uh, and then learn as you go. The important thing is that you are learning. You want to be a bee keeper, not a bee haver, where you get to the point where you're comfortable to get in here like this and have a look at the bees and what they're doing and do your brood inspections. You can of course get somebody else to do that for you but I really recommend getting in there. Most people who think they're going to get somebody else to do it actually end up fascinated themselves and getting right into learning and, and pulling apart the hive to see what's going on in the brood nest. Another tip is starting with a split or a nucleus like this it's it's a bit easier to get comfortable with doing your brood inspections so I'd recommend uh, starting and building your hive up and then putting your honey super on and that will give you a great introductory to learning what the bees do and how they build comb and you get to learn all about that world before you get the amazing treats of the honey in the top box. Beautiful. Nice. So I'm going to put this frame down. Can you get me another one out, Vija? Cedar Carol wants to know how many times on average when you're doing hive inspections do you get stung? Oh, okay. Um, I got stung uh, a couple of weeks back and I showed the stinger to the, to the camera. And it's typical without gloves that you get a sting occasionally. It's usually from putting your hand right on a bee and the bee doesn't like that and gives you a sting. So you learn to be careful with your hands. At first wear your gloves and then after some time you might experiment without them or you might decide to keep them on. Not wearing your gloves, you do get more stings. Um, and not wearing a bee suit, you do get more stings. So it's, it's, it's up to you. But um, do be careful, especially in the beginning. You don't want a situation that puts you off beekeeping. You want to make sure you're well protected and so on. But back to the question. Um, it tends to go, uh, sometimes I go months without getting any kind of sting, even when I'm doing a lot of beekeeping, and, and then I'll get really complacent and I'll do something silly and I'll get a whole bunch of stings. So that's generally how it goes, but I'm okay with bee stings. If you, if you weren't okay with bee stings, then you'd be a bit more careful than I am. Okay. These bees are being reasonably friendly today, which is good. Would you take that off? 
the top so it doesn't stick. Okay, that's a good question. So you can see up here we've got a little bit of burr comb on top, which is just comb the bees are building because they've got space to do so. Now, some people like to scrape that off and keep it nice and clean. It does help when it comes time to putting your excluder on the top that you don't get the frame stuck to the excluder. Now, I've just noticed the bees change tune a little bit. They're starting, getting a few bees that are getting a bit more erratic. So we're gonna add a little smoke now and just notice that the smoke will at first have an agitating effect and then a calming effect. So let's have a look. And I'll add the smoke right to the top of the frame so we can see what BJ was talking about here with the burr comb. Because when you add some smoke, it does clear the bees away from that area. So there we can see that. Now, a lot of beekeepers will scrape that off because it makes it a bit easier. Some beekeepers will leave it there so that uh, the bees can chew it away and recycle it when needed. In fact, you can see a bee right here chewing away. Notice that the tune change inside the hive, they're really, um, you know, it's supposed to be calming, but in this case, we've got a bit of agitation. You can see the queen? You can see the queen cell. So there we have it, the queen cell, down the bottom of the frame. You want to lift that up a little higher. And let's see. Interestingly enough, this little queen, there was two sized queens, queen cells here. There was a big one and a little one. The little one, you can see, has a torn edge to it, rather than a nice smooth edge. So that one, if you dial back to last week, you can see these two, that one emerged first. Then what happened is she would have wandered around the hive, made a piping noise, a, a, a tooting noise. The queen inside this one would have tooted back because she was close to coming out. This queen that at first merged came and stung this big queen cell. So what you have even is a perforation in the big queen cell where this queen has been stung and is now dead inside its cell. And that's how the first queen that got out gets the upper hand and makes sure she's the reign of the hive. So we can actually open up this queen cell now. If you lift this up, a bit sad, but this queen cell didn't make it. And what we should have there is a queen cell that has a queen that's been stung and is now dead in her cell. Okay, interesting. I'm still seeing movement there, so I could have been wrong about that. Um, but there was a rip in the side of the cell and this queen cup that was closed was now open. So we must have a virgin queen somewhere here in the hive. Okay, we're going to put that back now and we'll keep looking for a virgin queen. Let's put that one back in. In here? Yep, we've got plenty of space in there now and we've already got three over here. So we can go sideways. So when you said the, the queen had stung, do you mean literally as in like stung? Like Yes, so queens can sting without dying. The workers have barbs, the queens don't. So one of the reasons they do that is so that the queen can sting other virgin queens in the hive when they're fighting for who's going to be the egg layer of the hive. So they typically will go and sting other queen cells and that way um, you'll end up with one laying queen in the hive would be smarter if they had multiple laying queens and could just be civil about it. But anyway, uh, <laughs> they tend to go for one and they sort it out. Okay, let's have a look at this next frame. Any more questions? Today we're doing beginner beekeeping Q&A. We do that on the first uh, one of every month. It's our first Wednesday and we answer questions. No such thing as a silly question. The whole idea is you, you are learning and not afraid to ask questions because if you don't ask the questions you don't find out and it's all about just providing a great uh, learning environment if you've got answers to people's questions please chime in and help them learn as well 
see the Davids in Michigan in the US really harsh winter this year, wondering what, what protocols are good in the winter time for keeping your bees safe? Okay, I'm not an expert in overwintering at thebeekeeper.org. We do have some episodes dedicated to that. But the most critical thing to do is make sure they have enough stores to last the winter. So if, if it's um, winter is approaching, then just make sure that either there's enough stores to last and find out how much a hive needs in your area by asking some local beekeepers but basically if they don't have enough stores because honey is their their food their carbohydrate and they need that to survive over the winter and that's why they store it and lucky for us they often store more than they need and we can share some too but if you've got a colony that doesn't quite have enough stores then what beekeepers typically do is they will feed sugar syrup and they'll feed a thick syrup a one-to-one uh, sorry, two to one, two sugar, um, one water, and they'll cook that up, let it cool, and they'll put it in a feeder for the bees to, to uh, drink up and then deposit into the cells. And that will give that hive stores for lasting the winter. So that's probably the number one thing, is make sure the colony has enough food to survive a long winter, if that's what you've got ahead. This one's Okay, this is a heavier frame, so there must be more honey in here. Let's just have a little look around. And see what's on this frame. We have mainly honey around this area. Now I'm just having a look to see if I can spot a queen. I can't quite spot one here yet. Um, so what I'm going to do is going to shake these bees off so we can get a good look at it. If you're trying to get bees off a frame then first of all make sure it's not a really delicate frame like some of these per first ones we pulled out. You want to make sure it's one that's well connected to the edges. They typically don't connect the frame very well to the bottom but make sure it's connected to the edges Then give it a good sharp shake but not flat like a pancake. We want to be, still stay in the vertical so that as you shake it, it'll be, it won't uh, stress the comb as much. And then you're just shaking the frame like that and you get a lot more bees off and then you can see what's going on and really inspect the frame for, for any pests and disease issues and so on. So what I'm seeing here, as Bee just said, was a, a lot of honey. So that's making the frame heavier and you can also see fresh nectar and you can see some remaining brood because this hive was a split two weeks ago now. There we go. So if the queen had been on that frame, is she all right now? Just If she's in the box now, that's all right? She'll get back up onto the frames? Now that's a great question because the reason why I shook it right over the box was if the queen was on there, she'd end up in the box. If you shake her out on the ground, she might not make it back in and then you've got an issue with a queenless hive. So when you shake the bees off, just shake it over. If the, um, if the bees are just going into the box, they'll be fine. They'll just walk back up onto the frames. Good one keep the questions coming in. If you have answers to other people's questions, please chime in. Great. See, the Daniels from Western Australia, Dongara, caught a really large swarm into a new box about 11 days ago, and they've taken to it really well, building nice straight virgin wax comb. At what stage um, would they start to see the queen laying the new comb? Um, and on Saturday they went and opened it up and it looked like there's lots of clear nectar in all the frames. Is that a normal progression? Okay, clear nectar in all the frames, yeah. yes. That's what we've got here. If you have a close look, you can see that shining clear nectar in the frames. So the, um, what you typically will get is you'll take a split. Now, remembering that brood will, the worker brood will be 21 days. So you've got three weeks before there'll be none. If there was eggs on there, the bees will continue to, to, to 
feed those larvae and they'll eventually cap it over and become brood. So after three weeks you should see no brood at all. Um, but by then hopefully they've raised another queen and she'll be just about to start laying again. So you get this dip in population as they, as they get going. But hopefully in another, another week or two you'll start to see eggs down cells. If you don't then your hive doesn't have a queen and you've got two options. One is to order a queen in from it, you can often order them in the mail from a, a queen breeder or you can uh, transfer another frame from another hive that's got eggs on it or down the cells rather and they can then have another go at raising a queen from that. Now if you've had a few failed attempts and they don't raise a queen then uh, the best thing to do is actually to merge it back with another colony. Reason being is once they get what's called hopelessly queenless, it can get really challenging to get a hive to, to make its own queen or accept a new one again. And sometimes you're better off just uh, putting these frames back on top of another hive with a sheet of newspaper in between. They'll choose the, new, the newspaper away and get slowly um, as the pheromones mix between the two colonies, they will then merge with that colony and uh, you can try again next time. Hopelessly queenless. Sounds Hopelessly like, queenless. That's a good name for a song, doesn't it? <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> We've got beautiful pollen here. If you come to this side, down the cells you can see amazing colours of orange and yellow. And what's happened is that the forager bees have gone out and have found flowers with pollen. As they've gotten close to the flower, a static charge has has caused all the pollen grains to jump right off that flower on to their bodies. And bees are covered in hair, even their eyeballs are hairy, right? And then they, they use their, their legs to groom all of that pollen down to their pollen baskets, which is like a little bit of a spur on their back legs. And then they fly back to the hive with these big uh, balls, if you like, on their back legs. And if we look around, we sh should probably see, in fact, there's one right here. They're not particularly big balls, but you can see the white pollen loads on the hind legs there. Then what happens is they will um, dislodge that pollen and push it into the cells with their head. Now, bees don't eat pollen, they eat bee bread. And how they make bee bread is they ferment their pollen. So they'll pack the pollen down the cells and then they'll add their, their special sauce, their enzymes, and then top it with a little bit of honey and they'll let it ferment. And it's that fermented bee bread that is the primary food for worker bees when they're going through their larvae stage. So isn't that amazing? Any yeah. more questions? Yeah. So, um Chris is asking, he's in South Australia, uh, wondering uh, how long after the nuke arrives should he leave it in situ before transferring it to the new hive and should they put the entrance reducer on it when they first add the new bees to the new hive? Okay, so just uh, you've got a nucleus? Yeah, they've got a nucleus and just wondering how long you should leave it in situ I think before transferring it to his actual hive. The the nuke's a great way to start, right, because there's, there isn't that time pressure that you've got with a package. Um, you basically have a going beehive. It's like pretty much this amount of bees and this amount of frames. You'll have about half a box full of frames that have uh, brood, pollen, honey stores, a queen laying. So there is no time pressure. It's just about when uh, that nuke is ready. If it's the springtime there's lots of flowers coming then they'll be breeding up and they'll need a bigger box so that could be weak. Sometimes you'll nurse a nuke right through a whole season because it's just just a bit bit slow to get on its feet so sometimes it can be months but mostly weeks is a good time frame before you're installing that nuke into your box and we've got videos on how to install your nuke. It's reasonably straightforward. You get in your bee suit and you smoke it like this. You're basically pulling the frames out of your little nuke and putting them into your brood box. And that gives them a bit more space to create some more stores and build some more comb. Look after them and they'll grow. And then you can put your honey super on top. And, and what do you think about, should he put on the entrance reducer? 
So the entrance reducer is something just to reduce the entrance size. It depends a little bit. We don't tend to use them for protective purposes here, but in some countries you've got wasps that uh, could get into your hive and dec decimate a lot of bees. So some countries you've got mice is issues that go in the, in the entrance. So ask around, see what other beekeepers do. But the entrance is slightly reduced anyway on our flow hives for that reason of the bees don't need a massive big entrance and it's a bit easier for them to defend. So if you do has, have wasps in your area or your colony's really weak and you, you really want to give it a, a, a fighting chance, then by all means uh, add your entrance reducer to the, to the front here which will narrow it down to a much smaller entrance, easier to defend but mostly you don't need to. Great. It's the so short the answer. <laughs> Lynn's, Lynn's in New South Wales, Toucan Wool, and put on the flow frames, the super, last Saturday. Just notice some condensation on, on the windows. Does she need to do anything, or do the bees just get rid of that? Okay, it's normal to have condensation in a beehive, and the bees will actually use it as a water source. So. Don't be alarmed about condensation. Now, one thing that's different about a flow hive than a conventional hive is you can see it because you open the windows and you can see some condensation. The other thing is the windows get slightly cooler being less insulating than a solid block of wood and you might find that that's where they'll collect. Sometimes you open the window and a few minutes later the condensation comes. So it's a normal thing when you get humidity and you put it near a cool surface that air cools down can't have so much moisture dissolved in the air and it forms a little water droplet on that cool surface. So it's normal, don't worry about it. If you're getting ridiculous amounts of water and all the bees are wet and dripping and it's winter time then it's a problem. But otherwise don't worry about it. As the bees expand you'll notice that'll go away because the bees will be occupying that space and regulating the, uh, the hive and, and you won't see the humidity. But for now just uh, the bees will be totally fine down here and as they build up they'll then occupy that space. Right, Cedar, uh, Katrina's asking, they've had the hives and the bees um, since January this year and they've survived the winter really well. They put the super on a couple of weeks ago and the bees immediately moved up there and started working in the flow frames. But last weekend when we came back in the side and back window they are starting to store honey. It's pretty excited and just wondering when do you reckon their first harvest could possibly be? Okay that's a good question now you want to harvest when you see that the cells are capped so just have a look down see if you can see the capping on the cells of the flow frames now sometimes you can harvest a bit earlier you just see a couple of frames that that are ready and you can just go ahead and harvest those or you can wait till more frames are ready, but you can harvest as you go, as soon as they're, they've filled up the frames and put their capping on, and it's a good time to harvest. So use the rear window and the side windows to help you gauge when it is time to harvest. But go ahead and harvest a little bit if you're unsure. The flow frames allow you to do that just by inserting the key a little way and turning it and just harvesting some of the honey from one frame. And at least you can then have a taste of what's to come. Cedar, is the burr comb that you were talking about on top of those frames the same as the honeycomb? And is it just called that because it's not in the frames? Or Exactly, that's, that's a good way to put it. Burr comb is just honeycomb, not inside the frame. So the bees will put, put comb anywhere they can. If there's space, they'll put it there. So they've found a little bit of space above here and they're putting some extra comb, which they will eventually fill with honey or even use for brood right there on top of the frame. Now let's have a look at this frame. So what we've got here is a naturally drawn comb and this one's actually starting to go wonky. So I'll give you some tips on straightening naturally drawn comb. Now if I shake this hard I'm actually going to shake off uh, the comb altogether perhaps. So I can only shake it gently. There we go. Now, I'm shaking it over the box in case the queen's on there, she'll drop into the box. 
Now what we have here is some nice large size cells, so they're using that for honey storage. They'll often build larger cells for honey storage and what you can see here is a lot of honey being already stored. Now this frame isn't too bad, but it's just starting to wander off the guide. See in the middle, there's a comb guide at the top. You can see that wooden guide. But by the time it gets over here, it's wandering offline. Now it's not too bad and it'll probably be okay in this frame, but if you catch it early and just push it back on, then you get a straighter comb, easier to manage later. So what I'm gonna do is just push that with my hive tool. Now, if I just rest the frame here, I can do that. Now I could use some smoke to get them away, but I'm just going to push them away. And all I'm gonna do is grab the hive tool like this and just give it a bit of a push. And now it's back in line. So you want it over there on the comb guide. That's it. Doesn't matter if you mash the comb a little bit, bees are very good at fixing it up. So there we go. So we've straightened up that. Now let's have a look at the other end. Are they going wonky at the other end? They are as well. So let's straighten it up too. There we go. So I'm going to give that a little bit of a push there. Now there's a few bees in the way. There we go. So I'm being very delicate with the virgin wax that's just hanging. I want to be careful not to, to uh, get it too weak. Now, I'm just going to push this end back over as well. So with the hive tool, again, just pressing like this, just pushing it in towards the comb guide in the middle. That's it. And if you just give them a little bit of a gentle push, it'll save you some time later. Now, if they've gone really wonky and connected across to the other frame, then what you need to do is actually chop out the sections of comb and use some big elastic bands to hold it in place and the bees will connect it back into the frame again. Okay, we've got time for a couple more questions. Yeah, some great questions coming in today and so a lot of them will get answered online as well by the fantastic customer support team. But um, Kim's asking in the South Burnett region, first year um, of beekeeping, if the honey super is almost empty after winter, should I still do a brood box split now or wait for the honey super to be full again before splitting? Like, do we need to split annually? Okay, the answer is no. The time to split is when the bees are, are breeding up and you, you actually need some more space in the hive. So open the side windows if you can see not many bees in there then it's not time to split yet but have a look do your brood inspections and just just have a see what's going on you might find that um, they are going to go good soon they're going to la they've already laid a bunch of brood and it's going to emerge and the population will expand so by all means get in there and have a look what's going on but it's generally when the population is expanding that you're doing your splits or adding extra boxes to give them more room. Good question. Fantastic. And Hamish is asking, Cedar, how long once you've opened up the hive, it's getting close to an hour, but how long can you leave it open while you're working on it? So if it's warm, here we are in the Australian spring and it's warm, so if there was uncapped brood, which there's not in here because this hive uh, is, is split and there isn't a laying queen yet. But if there was, you'd want to be careful if it was a cold day that the uncapped brood doesn't get chilled. So that would be the concern. Uh, here we don't have that issue so much, but in the colder places or if we were doing a cold day in winter, we'd be careful not to get the uncapped brood uh, chilled. So that's probably the main reason why we choose mid-morning to mid-afternoon on a nice warm day to do our brood inspections. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is start putting this hive back together. Now we've muddled things around, we'll see if we can get them back in order. I didn't see a virgin queen in here. Hopefully she's here somewhere. We certainly saw the queen cell that had the torn edge, so she did emerge into the hive and she might not be any bigger than a worker bee at the moment and maybe 
hard to spot or might need my sister here to, because she's an expert on spotting queens. <laughs> if you want to get your eye in, then jump on our Instagram and follow along with the queen spotting. Hilary Kearney also has a great book called Queen Spotting, which helps you get your eye in for spotting queens. Okay, so this frame went over here on the edge next to this one. This one was the next frame. It's not a bad idea to try and remember which order they went in, or at least pay attention to... Um, now, I'm just having a look at that. That's not actually that frame. We pulled a frame out and it's been moved. And I can see the burr comb. And that's the reason some people don't like um, cutting away this burr and brace comb because it does tell a story of which frame goes where and can be helpful after. So I'm just having a look at this frame. And it's not that one either. It must be this one here. Okay. Where is it connected? Not that one. Now it's possible, oh, I know what's happened. We've pulled that frame out and we've turned it around and we've put it back in. So I can see where it was connected over here. Where there's the broken remains of the mating piece of bear comb there. The main thing you're trying to do, you can mix up frames, but the main thing you're trying to do is make sure there's the correct B space between the adjoining frame because otherwise the bees may not be able to service that area and a small hive beetle could take over. There we go. Just on those frames, see the Beth's asking, do you ever number your frames? Uh, don't because they end up they do end up getting cycled out and moved away, the number system would get pretty clunky pretty quickly. So just pay attention and make sure you're not squashing two bits of comb together that the bees can't service. That's the, the main thing. But one way to do that is just to try and put the frames back in the same order. That's assuming you're not doing cycling of frames or taking a split, etc. Okay, so I noticed that this hive has been a part a while and their tunes changed again to being a little more agitated. You can see they're starting to go for my veil a little bit now. So that tells me it's time for a little bit more smoke in the hive and that will have the calming effect eventually but we'll wind them up temporarily for a little bit. You can also smoke your hands which masks your own pheromone. Some people say you're much less likely to get a sting on your hand if you've Put them in the smoke of the bee smoker. It's like magic, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so. One of the questions came in on about the smoker cedar, like do we have videos and tips on lighting and how you get your smoker going and also what are you using today in the smoker? Uh, we're using pine needles. So Trace uh, collected up these pine needles and put them in a nice bin for us. So hopefully they'll stay dry in this rainy weather now. Uh, but it's just the pine needles we've put in here they're really easy to light a good a good easy one they don't last for that long but uh, they they are a nice fragrance and work quite well so you can grab those pine needles and this has got a few leaves in it as well now wear your gloves the smoke is hot don't do what i'm doing or use your hive tool to push it down and uh, That'll be, be a nice smoke, but you can use whatever you've got, some garden mulch, some leaves, or uh, some people use old hessian sacks, or even dried out cow poo. Like, there's so many different things you could use in your smoker, but I just use whatever I've got around me, uh, which is often pine needles or some grass, dried out grass clippings or sh sugar cane mulch that we've used in the garden. We do have tips on lighting the smoker. If you have a look at thebeekeeper.org, that there'll be a detailed one there. That's also a fundraiser, that uh, online bee course that gets rave reviews. And we're planting a million trees this year from, the, from funds raised, so we're pretty excited about that. And the whole idea is to create billions of safe blossoms for bees to forage on, not only the, the European honeybee, but all of the other pollinating uh, insects and animals and all of the life that those trees will be supporting. So have a look at thebeekeeper.org 
And also somewhere on our YouTube you'll find tips on lighting a smoker as well. Okay. Carol's tuned in and said paper bark is quite good in the smoker. Okay, paper bark. If, yeah. you've got, if you've got things that you use, chime in. Let us know what you use in your smoker. Beautiful. So we've got time for a couple more as we put the, the hive back together. A couple more questions. It's beginner beekeeping. Don't be shy. Ask those silly questions that sometimes you are afraid to ask. Here's, here's a question. So to when do you think you'll be putting the super on this hive? Okay, this won't get a super until one, we have an established laying queen and all of the comb has been drawn out in all of the frames. So when you've got a lot of bees in this box and they're, they're starting to overflow, we'll then put our super on top. So you know, any tips on getting your bees to um, start putting honey into the uh, flow frames? Okay, so if you're getting a bit impatient, the bees aren't storing any honey, then what I would recommend is scraping off some of the burr comb. Now if your hive is ready to have a super, then they will be building a bit of comb on top like this, but there'll be more of it. And typically it'll have a little bit of honey in it too, but it doesn't actually matter about the honey bit. And what you'll be doing is just scraping that off. So you scrape off the wax like that with your hive tool. It's a great hive tool, the J tool, because it's got a chisel at one end and a J at the other to help you. And you'll be collecting a bit up on there and just mashing it into the flow frame surface. And that will actually uh, give the bees a bit of wax to recycle in that area. So put that frame on the window side and you can enjoy watching them recycle the wax and build their cells in that area. Now, if there's no nectar flow, then you probably won't get any more action beyond that. You'll still have to be a bit patient. But if there is a nectar flow, they'll start putting honey in those cells that they've prepared. The recipe is a good nectar flow and lots of bees in your hive. When you open the side window, there's lots of bees in there. Then you'll see fast action. The bees will be storing honey on those flow frames. Right. Stephen's asking, um, has mounted the flow hive on the top of the brood box and should be ready to harvest some honey in the next couple of weeks. Just, I'm not sure where Stephen is, but just wondering, should he leave some frames of untapped honey for the bees for winter or can he just feed the bee patties during winter? Okay, so I don't do any feeding of bees really. We're lucky to live in an area where there's quite a lot of uh, forage most of the year round and the bees will store it for themselves and that keeps it easy but if you live in an area that does get um, long cold winters and you want to get a jump on the season then it is common for beekeepers to feed sugar syrup and sometimes also pollen patties as you say which often are made out of soy and they're a soy protein and they're a pollen substitute so um, we don't need to here. If you've got experience with feeding pollen patties, chime in on the thread below. So where's the best place, um, this person may not have seen us do the split, but where's the best place to place a new split in the position of the original hive or in a completely new spot? Uh, that's a great question. So typically what we do is we move the parent colony, the split came from over a little bit, and give the new little split the lion's share of the bees that are coming home and that way it'll boost up and get that split going a bit quicker. Now in this case we were uh, over near the parent hive there but what we did is we moved the hive over here but that was for a strategic re re reason of we were moving hives down to this lower level and we wanted the split to collect any returning foragers and it worked quite nicely, it really boosted up the numbers of this. So it's a bit complicated, but basically um, you can move bees around to where returning foragers are. And if you move your new split to where returning foragers are coming back, then that will boost the numbers. And you can play it a little bit by moving your hives around. Great, Josh is asking, so any reason, is there any reason not to put a hive on a flat roof? There is a lot of people that keep hives in the city on rooftops and they do very well because people plant all sorts of things in urban areas and it, people get amazing honey off their off their rooftops my uncle 
keeps hives on his rooftop in Canberra here in Australia and there's a lot of people keeping bees on balconies and rooftops in New York, in Berlin, all sorts of places around the world. So go for it, of course, uh, you know, be careful. Don't wander backwards taking your photo, etc. <laughs> <laughs> uh. See the, another one, Tim and Vicky, they're in Canada and they've put the first Flow Hive 2 Plus this year and the bees have built up, it's all looking great. And they'd noticed that there was some honey a couple of weeks ago and then they went to um, harvest it, but the honey's gone. And they're just wondering, is that normal? Did they leave it too long? Yes, the bees are storing honey for the time when they might like to use it. So it will come and go a little bit. Now, if the honey's capped, they usually will save that honey for later. It, if it's not quite capped yet, it'll often, the bees will move it to where they might need to top up some other cells or they'll be the first ones that they'll use for feeding the young larvae. It takes a comb of honey and a comb of pollen to raise a comb of brood. So it is what the bees use. Hopefully you'll get some more flowers again and you'll get some honey stores coming back. Great. Melissa's asking, after installing a new nuke, how long approximately until honey would be harvested? That's the million dollar question we get asked all the time like that. <laughs> it really depends. You can have really good luck and, you know, within that month the bees have built up and brought in a huge amounts of honey and it's all on. But you can also go through a whole season with none. But what's more likely is it takes some months before your bees are ready and built up and you put the super on and, and another month or two you will get some stores in those frames. So be patient. One hive might go good, another hive might be slow, so it's always good to have a couple of hives going, and then you really get to see what's going on in your area, and really does increase the chances of you getting some really nice honey harvests. Okay, let's, uh, we'll put this frame back in, which came from over here, and it's time to put the lid on this hive. Look at that beautiful comb, isn't that amazing? That's a fine job of the naturally drawn comb. You can see large cells and small cells. They're sizing them just how they want to, which uh, is said to have some health benefits, just allowing the bees to size the cells for their own purposes. I really enjoy the naturally drawn comb, but a lot of people also choose to put foundation in, which is fine. You can put foundation sheets, either uh, wax and wire or, or plastic in the frames, that's probably the most common way people keep um, bees and it's for a strategic reason if you're centrifuging your frames in conventional fashion then you will need the support of the wires through the comb to stop the frame blowing to pieces as it spins at high speed in the centrifuge. We don't need to do that because we're Flowhive beekeepers and we can harvest honey at the turn of a handle. Okay, next, last frame in. Now what we're going to do, this is another tip here, is when you put your frames in, push them all together so you've got the, any excess space is on either side. And that way it's the correct bee space for the bees to draw their naturally drawn comb. Next we're going to pop that lid back on. Now you could brush these away if you had a bee brush or use some foliage or you could use a smoker. Now a smoker's all but gone out um, so it's not working that well. So a little, uh, little brushing of them will get the bees just off that rim before you then go and put your inner cover back on. So we're just seizing the moment here when there isn't bees on that edge and we are putting the inner cover on like that. Thank you bees for letting us... Yeah, they were, they were great today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were a little bit, little bit. Um, they were giving me some warning, uh, warning that they weren't particularly uh, happy towards the end there. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise they were pretty friendly, no stings. It was a um, nice uh, show and tell. Thank you for all of your beginner questions. Let us know what you'd like us to cover in the future. And same time next week we will be showing you something interesting in the fascinating 
world of bees. Thanks for watching.